it's time to build the Chinese Carbon Superbike. Now this is an unfiltered tale of events that shows the highs and the lows of this build and some mistakes. I made a few and one that cost me three hours. By the end of the video, you would have learned something, had a giggle and we can marvel at the bike in all its two-tone Chinese Carbon AliExpress glory. Or I'll fumble all these parts together and you can be like, Jordan, that was a shambles, mate. Now, I'm not a mechanic, despite the unhealthy amount of tools that I have. So if you have some feedback, leave a comment below and make it constructive so that others can learn. Look at us all being friends. In my poll, most of you thought that the bike would weigh more than eight kilograms. We will find out if you are correct later in the video. Right, let's open up the toolbox. The first thing I'm gonna do is get the wheel set up because throughout the build, I want the bike to be able to stand and you'll need some shoes to do that. New tires have a certain memorable smell. Maybe I'm just odd smelling tires in my spare time. So first we'll get the tire half over the rim and make sure that the tire logo is aligned with the valve or the cycling gods will haunt you forever. I will haunt you. We want to make sure that we have the treads in the correct direction as well. This will be labeled on the tire with a small arrow. You may have to get your spectacles out because it's pretty damn small. Chuck a bit of air in the tube so it takes its circular shape. I know they're not tubeless. Jordan, you're in the stone age. Now place the inner tube in the tire and make sure it is in there or you run the risk of pinching the tube. Now for the fun part, getting the other side of the tire over the rim. Now these GP5000 tires are notorious for being tight. On the first wheel, I use tire levers to maneuver the final section of the tire over the rim. On the second tire, I actually managed to do this all by hand, which I was pretty surprised about. Now give them some air, I go to around 110 to get them seated. You'll hear them snap, crackle and pop like you're eating Rice Krispies in your childhood. Deflate a little and then bring them back to your desired PSI. I'm gonna have them around 85. Because the bars are integrated on this build, I really need to think about the order of events. What happens when to ensure that everything slots together graciously? if that's what you want to call it. So next up is cutting the steerer tube. Now to do this, I need to chuck everything together so that I can measure where the cut needs to be. So in go the bearings and the fork. Then I put the spacers on top, followed by the stem. Now the stem was pretty tight, which I'm not 100% sure is correct, but there is no going back now. So a little shimmy and a wiggle and the stem was down onto the spacers. Now I had planned to allow an extra 25 mil on top of the bars with a 15 mil spacer and a 10 mil spacer. Now I changed my mind later, but for now that's what we are measuring too. Now this is your moment to double check that everything is tight and there isn't any play in the headset. So where do I need to cut? Let me explain. Firstly, you need the fork steerer to finish three to four millimeters lower than the final spacer to allow the compression plug to pull everything downwards. If the gap isn't there, the compression plug can't pull everything together. Now from everything that I've read online with a carbon fork steerer and a carbon stem, you want at least five mil of spacer on top of the stem. So with that in mind, we need to cut three to four mil below the final spacer. This will give us our three to four mil gap for the compression plug, right? Now to give me that three to four mil, I took the 10 mil spacer off the top and placed a seven mil spacer on the stem. That gave me the three millimeters and I can simply mark around the washer. Now I bought a bag of carbon washers off Amazon to give me the flexibility that I needed. Mistake number one. Now mistakes are a fact of life. It's a response to those mistakes that count. Those are very wise words. There's a saying used by people who measure and cut things. Measure twice, cut once. So I decided to measure everything again and visualize how it would look when all complete and compressed together. This is when I realized that the compression plug has a lip and this lip sits on top of the steerer tube, which essentially gives a steerer tube extra length. In total, that was around three to four millimeters. So let me explain. We now have three to four millimeters in length for the depth of the compression plug. And we also need another three to four millimeters so that the final spacer sits above the steerer tube. And for good measure, I added another millimeter for any slop that was in the bearings or the headset because it's currently not compressed together. So I actually needed to cut seven to eight millimeters lower than the final height of the top tube. Off camera, I actually changed my mind and decided to go with a 15 millimeter and a five millimeter spacer on top of the stem. 25 millimeter of spacers look like a power station cooling tower. Being faster is way more important than having a sore neck. Don't tell my bike fit of that. So now it's time to put your money where your mouth is and start swinging a saw around. If you do cut them too short, then they'd make a good ornament on the mantelpiece. So 
win-win, right? So remove everything from the bike and get the tools set up that you need. I have a small vise. This is actually a jewelry vise. Then I have a cutting guide. This is used to clamp the forks. Then I place a cutting guide into the vise. Now I'm using a 12 inch hacksaw with a 32 TPI blade. If you don't have a specific carbon cutting blade, then a high tooth count blade is the next best thing. Now place the forks into the cutting guide. I actually did a test cut off camera to make sure that everything was working as expected. It was. For the actual cut, line the forks with the cutting guide and begin cutting slowly. It's pretty hard not to cut straight with a cutting guide, but keep your motion as linear as possible. Get a smooth action going and the blade will do all the work. Don't try to force a blade down like you're cutting your onion for your spaghetti bolognese later. Get that chopping motion out of your head, but not the thought of a delicious meal as a reward for your wonky cuts. Continue the majestic arm movement slowly and steadily until you are through. Cutting carbon like this can leave a rough edge or fibers sticking out, so grab a fine file or sandpaper and finish off the edge. I bought these jewelry files from Amazon to do the job. Anyone would have thought I'm building a watch or something with all these delicate little tools. Time to check that everything is correct with another temporary install. So get the bearings, fork and bars back on the bike. While I'm here, I wanna talk about the compression plug that came with the headset. Now, ideally I want the plug to cover the whole stem to give extra support where the stem is clamping the fork steer arm. Now, as you can see, this plug is not going to do that. Having this support is also the reason that you add five mil of spacer on top of the stem. Otherwise you would need to cut the fork steerer three millimeters below the top of the actual stem itself. So I'll upgrade the plug in the future. Um, I just don't have one to hand right now. Many people may not know, but these compression plugs actually have two screws and one screw screws into the other screw. It's like screw inception. It's only when we wake up that we realize something was actually strange. Firstly, I'm gonna grease the threads, then install the compression part of the plug with the first screw. This grips the fork steerer and applies radial pressure outwards. Then on go the washers and finally the top cap, which I can tighten until there is no plate in the headset. Onto the elephant in the room. No, not me. The thing that I've been looking forward to the least, routing compressionless cables through the integrated bars and frame. Now for starters, if you've never felt these cables, take it from me, they are stiff, very, very stiff. So while the bike is temporarily together, I use this opportunity to roughly measure the brake and gear housing, allowing an extra 10 to 15 centimeters at the levers and at the final destination. As this housing is reinforced, it is easy to crimp the ends of the housing or the inner lining can become compressed. So check each end. I brought some dentist tools on Amazon, which has this small funky tool. God knows what that is used for, but it allowed me to open up the cut ends nicely. Now we have the housing cut, we can take the bike apart and start routing through the bars. Now let me just show you what the final result should look like. So the gear and brake housings are separate to allow for easy routing. The gear housing also needs to finish on the outside of the bars as this is where they enter the shifters. The brake cables enter the shifters on the inside of the bars. You also want to consider how the housings enter the fork so they don't need to overlap inside the frame. Think when you sit on the bike where the brake and gear cables need to route from. There are various routing options for these bars which are displayed on the product page on the website. Now I chose this method of routing because I thought it would be the best for organizing the cables. It's also how the cable guides came pre-installed. It must be right. Not my best decision as you will find out later. I've seen various techniques on how to do this and after feeling the strength of these cables, I'm gonna use what I feel is the most foolproof. Now you're either gonna think that this is absolutely genius or unsubscribe and end our friendship. Please don't. So this all starts with strimmer cable or weed whacker cable if you are across the pond. One of these things, whatever you wanna call it. Now I have two types here. I have 1.25 millimeters and 1.6 millimeters. For those that don't know, gear cable is 1.2 mil and brake cable is 1.6 mil. So the larger strimmer cable is for the brakes and the smaller cable is for the gears. I then cut the strimmer cable for the gears and the brakes, so four lengths in total, each time allowing enough cable to go through the housing in the bar and stem combo and through the actual cable housing itself. This meant that the strimmer cable was cut to around 50 to 60 centimeters longer than each gear and brake cable housing. Grab a coffee, it's about to get interesting. I removed the tape that was on the existing guides through the bar so that I could get to the ends. I added my own electrical tape so that no cables could escape, then threaded my strimmer, weed whacker cable, through the cable guides. 
At this point, you need to get each cable through the correct cable guide. I could then remove the pre-installed guides from the bars. Now, threading the housing onto the trimmer cable. Make note of which end of the housing will finish at the actual shifter itself. If your measurements are correct, you'll have extra trimmer cable come out the end of the housing. Now, you can add some form of clamp to the end of the trimmer cable. This was a simple nut and a bolt. What this does is allow you to have something to pull against. So as you pull the other end of the trimmer cable, you are pulling the cable housing as well. This technique works really well. I'm really pleased that I use this method as the brake housing in particular is really hard to manipulate. Now I rinse repeat this process until all the housing are through the bars. You can then remove the trimmer cable and go and cut your grass. I have to shout out OZ Cycles for documenting this whole technique on his channel. Time to rearrange the workspace for optimal performance. Nothing like a layout change to get the juices flowing. So get the frame up on the stand facing a table and put the bars onto the table. This makes it easier when routing the cables through the frame. Now to run the housing through the frame. First we need to install the headset bearings in the frame. Once the cables are routed you can't install the bearings. So give them a good old lathering in high performance grease. I like to get my hands involved and really feel the performance of the grease. We also need to place the spacers on the cables that are gonna be underneath the stem. Now in my case, we have the bearing seal or cap, the 10 mil spacer and the five mil integrated spacer. They also need to be the correct orientation. So make sure they are because you'll have to undo a lot of hard work if they are not. As the bars were so successful, I actually followed a similar process for the frame. Luckily for me, some kind human already routed cable guides through the frame. So installing the strimmer cable was super easy. So I threaded the strimmer cable through the front and rear derailleur guides and also the rear brake. The front brake goes through the fork, which we'll look at a little bit later. Once the strimmer cable was through, I then clamped the end of the cable again and pulled each cable housing through the frame. The rear brake was probably the hardest because it's the longest and the brake housing is thicker than the gear housing. The rear gear housing was pretty similar and went smoothly without any hiccups. The front derailleur works a little differently. You route the housing to just beneath the bottom bracket, then it exits the frame. It's so much easier to do this with the bottom bracket not installed. So this is why I'm doing this before the bottom bracket and crankset installation. At this point, we have three housings through the frame. All of them should have plenty of excess at both ends by the levers and where they exit the frame. At this point, you know when you're doing something and everything is going a little too smoothly? In your mind, you attribute the smoothness to your meticulous planning. But the little chap on your shoulder is saying, something's not right here. That all went a little bit too well. Let's install the bars and find out. So firstly, I checked the cable housing order through the frame, remembering the order that we wanted the cables from earlier. We got it looking pretty good. I gave the bearings a little bit more grease, added the bearing seal or cap, then the washers. At this point, the forks can come through the frame and you can thread the front brake housing through the hole in the fork steerer. And it comes out on the left side of the fork by the caliper. For this, I didn't need a guide. I simply pushed the housing through and it came through with ease. The wheels went on so I had some leverage. The stem went on with a little bit of carbon grip. I say that like it was easy. Uh, I had to actually push the stem on a little, pulled all the cables through the frame, rinse repeated until the, the stem was actually seated correctly. Then the 15 millimeter washer and the five millimeter washer on top of the stem. And then the compression cap was tightened in the fork steerer and the top cap snug down. At this point, you can check if there is any play in the headset. Check for any rattles in the frame. Check the bars side to side motion and make sure they are free and smooth. Perfect. We did it. Don't be so naive, Jordan. Don't assume you can't handle a tough situation. You don't know that until you try. So the biggest issue with these rooted housings is pinching it or creating a kink in the actual housing itself. Now think about your garden hose. When you create like a big bend, you get no water. Basically that. So to test it, I got a spare gear cable and I tried each housing. Both gears were fine. The brakes, not good. The rear brake had some resistance. The front brake was very tight and the inner cable couldn't get through. I told you this was unfiltered and that was mistake number two. I like to think if you're not making mistakes, then you're probably not learning. So what happened? Let me show you. So the brake cables exited the stem towards the front of the stem. This means that the brake housings drop down fairly low in relation to the head tube height. 
and what happened is the housing had to raise up again to enter the head tube. This routing meant that the housing had a tight turn and therefore pinched the cable housing. So the mistake was choosing the route for the cable housing that allowed the best arrangement of the housings, not the path of least resistance, specifically the brake housings as these are thicker and stronger. The solution, remember the options on the website, I was going to choose this one where all the cables are routed to the back of the stem. Now when the housings come out of this part of the stem closer to the head tube, they are higher and have a smoother curve into the head tube of the frame. So it's less chance the cable will get pinched. A logic. So I needed to reroute the brake housings with the bars on the bike. I used the same technique as I did earlier to route them the new way through the stem and bar combo. Instead of them coming out of there and there, then they come out, all come out up in here and it just means that they don't have such a strong bend. All in all, it took me around two to three hours to fix this mistake. And 30 minutes of that was spent scratching my head. Let's just call that self-reflection time. I then tried the inner cable through the four housings and it went through without issue. Result. With all the cable housings in the correct order, we need some components to connect them to. So on went the shifters. Firstly, I removed the gear cable that came with the shifters and replaced them with the Jaguar shift cable. That was pretty straightforward. You just need to make sure you're in the correct gear so that you can see through the shifter itself to get the new gear cable through. Then I loosened the clamp bolt on each shifter and slid them into position on the bars. These needed to be in roughly the correct position, but we will refine at a later date. They will likely be moved when I get my bike fit anyway. Clamp them down to five newton meters for now so they don't swing around everywhere. Onto the rear derailleur and the first point of call is cutting the housings at the shifter end. To do this, I put a spare bit of housing into the shifter to see how much extra cable actually slides in. This was around 13 millimeters. Then I wrapped the gear cable around the bars in the root it's going to take. Aligned with the shifter entrance and measured an extra 13 millimeters to allow for the housing to slide into the shifter perfectly. I then cut the gear housings down to the correct size, making sure the end of the cable isn't blocked with the dentistry tools. I pushed the inner gear cable through the lever, added the end cap and then pushed the inner cable through the housing about 20 centimeters. It can't go all the way through at this point as I still need to cut the other end of the cable housing. So pushing it in slightly stops it flapping around like an elephant's trunk in the wind and stops it collecting dirt. Onto the rear derailleur, I started by checking if the derailleur hanger bolt was tight as this is a small bolt and it can wiggle loose. Never assume that anything is spot on out of the factory. Unless you've had your spanner on it, you never truly know. I then greased the threads on the mounting bolt for the rear derailleur and installed it into the hanger. I tightened the bolt to around eight to 10 Newton meters, which is what Shimano and SRAM recommend. At the derailleur, I measured the gear housing and cut it down to size. Again, I left a little extra to allow for the bike fit. I could then push the inner cable all the way through until it popped out the other end of the housing. Getting the housing to sit where I wanted it to in the shifter actually took a little bit of persuading. At the derailleur end, I added the end cap and the cable and then threaded it through the derailleur itself clamped it down with the anchor bolt. The front derailleur followed a similar process, cutting the housing at the shifter, remembering to allow 13 millimeters for the extra that slides into the shifter itself. Adding a cable end, then threading it around 20 centimeters into the housing to stop it flicking around. We then needed to add an end cap to the housing where the housing comes out of the frame at the bottom bracket. This then fed into the housing stopper at the entrance to the frame so the cable housing stops at the bottom of the frame and it's only the inner that travels up through the frame itself to the front derailleur. I could then feed the inner cable through the housing and pull everything into place. For the front derailleur install, I greased the mounting bolts. This is a brazed on type derailleur which mounts onto the fixed hanger on the frame. I mounted this at its highest point for now, which caused me a headache later. At this point, it was late in the day and I was getting tired. I started making those rookie errors. Thing. Now I pulled the inner cable through and snugged it down gently in its temporary resting place before the final adjustment later in the video. Now I'm leaving the bar tape off so that when I go for my bike fit, we can adjust the levers into the perfect position. The brakes, just a minor component when you're riding around at 25 mile an hour, as long as they roughly work, right? To install the brakes was exactly the same for the front and rear. I started at the bars again by measuring the extra housing that slides into the shifters. For me, there wasn't any extra that I couldn't actually see. So I cut the cables then and there in situ. Now don't forget to surgically inspect the cut ends. I'm gonna keep repeating this until you dream about it tonight. 
because of the strength of the cables I had to loosen the levers to actually get the brake housing installed in the shifter. Normally the Jaguar brake housing has a different end that goes into the shifter but they were a casualty when routing the brake cables through the frame. Mistake number three. Everything seems to work though so it's nothing I'm going to lose sleep over. I then threaded the brake cable through the shifter and 20 centimeters into the housing to stop it flapping around. Remember, not all the way as we still need to cut the other end. The front caliper is the one already mounted on the 160 millimeter adapter. This has relatively small mounting bolts compared to the back, which has larger mounting bolts that go through the frame. Now the rear brake mounts directly onto the frame. In the Duintec F1 box, there are various mounting bolts for the rear caliper, so make sure you are using the correct ones. Only one worked for me, so it's a trial and error situation. We then needed to work out how much cable goes into the caliper so we know where to cut. But first, we needed two pop pop cable ends which stands for point of power tell me you don't love an abbreviation that sounds fancy and fast these end caps are designed specifically for five millimeter compressionless housing and act as a reducer allowing the housing to fit into the caliper now i won't lie to you peeps i spent 15 minutes thinking i'd made a fatal error here somehow along the line and that all my hard work rooting the cables was a big old fail. A quick research on Google and then these mysterious end caps that I had previously dismissed as strange looking things quickly became my saviour. So mistake number four, not reading the Jaguar end cap guide and wasting another 15 minutes of my life. I made a terrible mistake. To be fair, who would read that? On went the pop end caps and we could see how much cable would be needed. I then cut the cable down making sure the ends of the cables weren't closed or the inner lining crimped with my dentistry tools. I'm pretty sure I could surgically remove a canine at this point. I then needed to remove the calipers so I could get these stiff cables into them. I could then loosely tighten the calipers ready for final adjustment later. I'll be doing a full review on these brakes and other components on this build so subscribe to see those videos coming soon. To finalize the cable fiasco, I cut off the excess inner cable so they weren't dangling everywhere. I then use a spirit level to check the shifters uh, were actually level and tighten the clamp bolts around five newton meters. Now onto the bottom bracket install. I have my bearing press at the ready and the bottom bracket that came with the Sensor Empire Pro group set that I am using. Firstly, I'm gonna inspect the cups on the actual frame to make sure they don't have any imperfections or paint overspray or anything that would stop the bottom bracket entering the frame smoothly. Then I grease everything. That seems to be the running theme on this build. Get everything all greasy. The bearing press has specific bushings for the 24 mil axle. I think that's what they're called. Dad, drop me a message and let me know. So first we can place the bearings roughly in the frame centrally. The key here is to press them in centrally or evenly or uniform. Whatever you want to call it, get them straight. Any angle is not going to be fun. So the bar goes through and then the bushings and then the large, let's call them wing nuts, go onto the threads either end. Go really slow and make sure they are straight. This is your final warning peeps. Now you can start to tighten. For me, this was fairly smooth. I had a couple of points where the bearing seemed to grip slightly and then slid and made a little sort of pop. But overall, it was a successful mission. Wipe away the excess grease. Then I checked to make sure that the lip of the bottom bracket was flush with the frame. With the bearings installed, we have created a home for the crank set so let's spin that up and get that chucked in the frame it's starting to look like a bike miraculously so first we installed the chain rings on the crank arm this was with three small bolts that tightened to nine newton meters i then greased the spindle and specifically grease where the bottom bracket bearings will be in contact with the spindle. Shove the drive side through the frame, giving it a light tap if need be. Nothing like a bit of persuasion with mechanical work. I'm surprised I haven't got the hammer out yet. With the drive side in the frame, you can grease the spline on the non-drive side crank arm and place it onto the spindle. We can use this little tool that came with the group set to preload the bearings. I actually have the Shimano tool, so I'm gonna use that. On the tool it states, you should tighten to around 0.75 or 1.5 Newton meters. Enough to take out the play in the bearings and crank set. Tighten the pinch bolts to 12 or 14 newton meters. I like to tighten each bolt little by little so equal pressure is applied to each side. To check, give the crank arms a good old grip and see if you can feel any play. It also seems strange that there is no cap on the drive side crank arm, so this is just open for the whole weld to enter it seems. I'm sure the UK weather is going to absolutely love that. Now you would think that installing a seat post and seat would be simple, right? But I have a gripe with how you install the seat itself. Firstly, thanks to Pet Tech for commenting on a previous video saying that 10 to 12 newton meters on the frame seem too tight for a carbon seat post. When I check the actual plug that grips the seat post, 
that said six newton meters max. So there was conflicting information there. I'm gonna go with 5.5 newton meters and carbon grip to make sure the seat post doesn't slip. We'll see if that works when I go over my first pothole, maybe my ass will be on the rear wheel. So on went the carbon grip, in went the clamp and I tightened it up. It's very easy to round the seat post bolt. So I use an extension with my torque wrench to give me more room. Tighten the bolt to 5.5 newton meters and we are looking good. No, we're not. I forgot to add this little seal that goes over the clamp. So out came the seat post, carbon grip getting everywhere, and then I dropped the seat clamp down into the frame. My heart sunk for a second, and then I realized I can just turn the frame upside down, so quick solutions. I then repeated my steps, reinstalled everything, and it's looking pretty good. Out came the seat post clamp, which inserts into the circular part of the seat post. Firstly, the brackets do go onto the seat, no problem, and grip the rails on the seat. But then you have to push these two wedges in and try and align the bolt, and there lies the problem. Now let me explain. When you push a wedge in, naturally it forces itself down. Now if you have a screw through that wedge, then the screw is also going to be pushed down. In addition, the screw isn't particularly long to reach the wedge on the other other side. This means it's easy to cross thread the bolt. I eventually got this in by tapping the bolt very gently with a very small hammer. I also looked into the other side, the other wedge, and made sure everything was aligned. And that way I was able to screw the bolt in. Against my better judgment, I'm gonna be using the Sensor Empire cassette instead of the Shimano 105 cassette that came with the wheels. This is so that I can give a fair review of the Sensor Empire Pro group set later down the line. Now installing the cassette is pretty easy. You simply slide all the cogs onto the free hub body on the wheel. As the Sensor cassette is pretty much one piece, it all just slides on together, apart from the two final smallest cogs. Now I can start the lock ring on the cassette by hand. The threads are really fine on the lock ring and we don't want to cross thread them. I grab the torque wrench and the Shimano style cassette tool and then the socket to fit over the cassette tool. Now when you're tightening the cassette, you can hold the wheel so you don't actually need a chain whip. Now give it some elbow grease and tighten up to 40 newton meters, which is pretty tight. And there we have it, simple, the cassette is installed. It's all about the tools on this one. The center lock discs are a similar setup. We should take a moment to look at these discs though because there's something about them, they do something to me. Let's Fisbee them onto the bike. And by Fisbee, I mean grab some grease and get a load on the spline and then slide the disc onto the wheel. We then have the lock ring, which we will grease as well. Start by hand. Again, those threads are delicate, so don't go in like the Hulk. You need to close your eyes, feel the rotation and become one with your bike. You can then bring out the big guns, AKA the torque wrench and tighten to 40 newton meters. Do the same for the other wheel and bish bash bosh, you're done. Chuck the wheels on the bike using a through axle, which you tighten to seven newton meters. She can stand on her own two feet. It's an emotional thing to witness. I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna at this moment in time, I realized I've never actually cut a chain to length. I've only ever sized a chain against an old one. Now a quick Google search, 20 minutes of research and I learned everything I needed to know from that bearded guy on the Park Tools YouTube channel. You will know who I'm talking about. Now I'm gonna use a large cog to large cog method to get the sizing correct. So I place a chain in the large cog on the cassette at the back and the large chain ring at the front. Add the split link because that gives you an extra link, which is extra length to the chain. Then you find the nearest link where the chain could actually join. You need an outer link, which is gonna be the split link, to join with an inner link. Then you can count two rivets down the chain, one, two, and this is where we will split the chain. Over to the workbench, get the chain in the splitter tool and split the chain where we marked. Then simply guide the chain through the rear derailleur, then guide it through the front derailleur and complete the loop. I then use a bit of creatively fashioned metal wire with a simple hook at each end to hold the chain in place. That way you aren't trying to install the split link whilst trying to pull a lubed chain together at the same time. Get a grip. It works an absolute treat. Then I use a chain pliers to pull the split link together. With the wheels on the bus, we can adjust the brakes. This is the same process for the front and the rear. So firstly, I'm gonna spin the wheels and check if the discs are true, which they are. If you spin the wheel when they're going around like this, then Houston, we have a problem. Then I'll loosen the caliper mounting bolt so that the caliper can actually move freely. I'll pull the brake on, do this a couple of times and then hold the brake on tight. At this moment in time, you'll want about six hands in total. Luckily for me, my fiance, who has constantly heard about this bike build for the last three months, was willing to pull the lever for me. I'm sure she was overjoyed to be involved in the build after hearing about it for so long. Babes, how much have you enjoyed hearing about the bike build for the last three months? so much. <laughs>
With the brake pulled on, the caliper will self-center. You can then tighten the mounting bolts, still holding the brake on. Okay. Next on the list, pull the cable through tight so there is no slack in the cable and tighten the anchor bolt down. Now with these hydromechanical Duintec F1 brakes, it's this little screw basically on the caliper that adjusts both pads together. I did exactly that until the wheel could spin freely. I then repeated the process on the other caliper so both brakes were good to go. Before adjusting the gears, you need some pedals, which I had actually completely forgotten. So I whipped my carbon Ultegra pedals off my other bike and chucked them on the new gel. Don't forget to grease the threads and tighten to 10 Newton meters, or you may never get them off again because they self-tighten as you pedal. On the front derailleur, I loosened the anchor bolt so the cable is free. I needed to adjust the linear angle to make sure that it's in line with the chain ring and not off at an angle. I checked the high and low limit screws. These screws decide how far across the derailleur can travel towards a small cog and then the high screw to the biggest cog. These can be adjusted individually with the small screws on the derailleur itself. Mine were all good. Then I flicked the gear into the smallest chain ring at the lever. This is so I can pull all the slack through the cable and tighten the anchor bolt. I then give it a try to see how the gear is shifting. It took some tinkering and I adjusted the angle of the derailleur a couple of times, but eventually I was happy and got it working well. This is when I realized I hadn't adjusted the height of the derailleur. Adjusting the height also changes the cable tension, so it's back to square one. That was my next mistake. I adjusted the derailleur so it was two millimeters above the largest chain ring and then completed the whole process again. You know, there's nothing I love more than repeating myself due to completely avoidable mistakes. Sarcasm? For the rear derailleur, it's much the same. First, loosen the anchor bolt so everything can move freely. I then check the high and low limit screws, which in hindsight would have been better to do with the chain off. For me, the low limit screw needed to be adjusted. The derailleur couldn't actually go all the way towards the smallest cog. The high screw was okay and the chain couldn't pass further than the biggest cog towards the spokes. Then it was a final adjustment. I unscrewed the barrel adjuster a couple of turns. This allowed for finite adjustment in both directions. I then adjusted the cable and tinkering in a way I could click through all the gears, the drive chain is complete. And the final weight of the bike is... 8.57 kilograms. Click here to see exactly what all the parts are, how I actually bought them direct from China, the cost of the build in total, and all of the individual parts and how much they all cost. Basically everything you need to know if you wanna do a build like this yourself. Babe, turn the camera off. The people aren't ready for this content yet.